Not a single voter has voted yet, but with just four weeks until the Iowa caucuses and five weeks until the first primary votes are cast in New Hampshire, it looks like Donald Trump has an insurmountable lead, at least if you believe the polls. In fact, our colleagues at 538 have looked at the historical data and found that no presidential candidate in history has ever been this far ahead in the national polls as Trump is at this point in the cycle and gone on to lose the nomination. This week, one candidate hoping to break that historical trend, Nikki Haley, secured the endorsement of New Hampshire's popular governor, Chris Sununu. It's just the latest sign of momentum for the former South Carolina governor who also served as U.N. ambassador in the Trump administration. Big dollars have also started flowing Haley's way as she seeks to become the leading alternative to Trump. I traveled to New Hampshire to sit down with Haley and Sununu as they team up to try to catch the front runner. As you'll hear, Haley is trying to walk a fine line, taking on Trump but not alienating his supporters, at times attacking the former president, at other times praising him, sometimes in the same sentence. Governor Haley, this was the endorsement that everybody not named Trump was trying to get. So what does it mean? I mean, it's huge. You know, first to have the endorsement of the largest conservative, freedom-loving grassroots organization in the country with Americans for Prosperity, and then go get the endorsement of the live free or die governor. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, it's rock solid. And, you know, we're focused on, okay, how do we make it a live free or die country? How do we put the people back in charge? And Chris is such a great partner. We've had a great time. We've won so many rooms and, you know, we're just getting started. How are you going to help her win New Hampshire? Because, I mean, obviously right now Trump still has a huge lead. He's well, got to leave for a long yeah. time. Well, look, no one, in, no one in New Hampshire is going to vote for Nikki Haley just because the governor says so, right? Mm -hmm. You earn it. Uh, I think we've been pretty successful in knowing how to earn it, how to engage with constituencies, what's important, to, that not just what the voters want to hear, but how they want to ask the questions. And most importantly, how they're going to earn the trust with, with folks. We can all agree on a lot of policies. We want to know that as individuals, we come first. And that's exactly what Nikki's bringing to the table. What are the are the stakes here? How important is this primary, not just New Hampshire, the Republican primary? I think this election is important for Republicans and Democrats. I mean, you see Democrats are just as worried. You've got 75 percent of America that say they don't want a Trump-Biden rematch. And so there's a lot at stake for our country. And I think for Republicans, they're looking at the fact that, look, we've got to get this back on track. And they like the idea of a new generational leader. You know, I agree with a lot of Trump's policies. I think he was the right president at the right time. But looking at the situation now, our country's in disarray, the world is on fire, and chaos follows him. And we can't have a country in chaos for four more years or we won't survive it. I hear you say that a lot, chaos follows him. But is it chaos follows him or does he create the chaos? What, I mean, that sounds so passive, He chaos follows him. I mean, I, rightly or wrongly, you call it whatever you want to call it, but when you feel it, it's chaos. When I tell these rooms that, they all nod their head. They get it. It's the chaos. And Americans are tired. They want government to work for them again. And they want to win. And you look at these general election polls, and Biden and Trump are head to head. It's going to be another nail biter. I defeat Biden by 17 points. That's a total mandate. As you said, Governor, nobody's going to vote for Nikki Haley because you said yeah. to vote for him. Uh, maybe some people, but not a lot. But I mean, you're. Track record on endorsements in the midterms, a number of candidates you endorsed lost to much more Trump-centered candidates. I I'm old enough to remember when your father uh, endorsed George W. Bush in 2000 and McCain ended sure. up winning by 18 points. So how's, why is this going to be different? We have 40 days. We're going to be out on the trail. We're going to be helping make that grassroots support, helping build folks up. But right now, there's so many folks undecided. Everything's been delayed. A lot of the decisions won't be made really until the last couple of weeks. And in New Hampshire, it's all about results. So if you're results driven, you want that efficiency in government, here's the path, not just to get the Republican Party unified again, but the entire country, give them a strong next generation of conservative leadership that everybody can get behind. And what I appreciate about Chris's endorsement, it's not a one and done. This for the next 40 days, we're partners because we honestly believe we have a country to save and we're determined to do it. So uh, let me ask you, uh, speaking of Trump, um, he has, claimed absolute immunity uh, in his defense to the election interference case. Is that your view? Do you believe a president has absolute immunity for anything that happens while they're president? I'm going to let the courts figure that out. I mean, the last thing you're going to see me do is 
weigh in or learn the details about any of his court cases because I can't follow 91 charges that and makes, I'm not going to. That makes total sense. But let me just ask you on the principle, forget his case. Do you think that a president of the United States, that if you get elected president, you would have absolute immunity for anything you did while you were president? Well, I think the court issues are, do you have immunity when you're president? When you're not president, at what point does that line fall? I'm going to let judges decide that. I don't know where the line falls. President Trump's going to have to defend himself no matter what. If he's found guilty, he's found guilty. If he's found innocent, he's found innocent. It would be wasted energy for me to sit there and focus on court cases and not focus on how to win that room that we just left. Because that sounds a lot like saying you're above the law, that a president's above the law. That you I mean, can he can answer for himself. I am not in a court case. I'm happy I don't have to answer for that. Yeah. So let him answer it. I want to ask you about something you said not long after January 6th. I'm going to read the quote. You said, we need to acknowledge he let us down, meaning Trump. He went down a path he shouldn't have, and we shouldn't have followed him, and we shouldn't have listened to him, and we can't let that ever happen again. Do you still feel that way? Of course. I don't ever want that to happen again. I think January 6th was a terrible day, and I think that the tone at the top matters. On so many levels, the tone at the top matters. Look, anti-Trumpers think I don't hate Trump enough. Pro-Trumpers think I don't love him enough. I call it like I see it. If I agree with you on something, I'm going to say it. If I disagree with you on something, I'm going to say it. At the end of the day, people want the truth. They want to know what I think. I tell them what it is, and we let the chips fall where they may. That's what I felt about that situation on January 6th. I hope we never have an event like that again. And, and you said we shouldn't have followed him, and we shouldn't have listened to him. We can't ever let that happen again. Well, I think the part, the problem was, and it, what everybody, so many of his friends and family and everybody saw is you had good people who went there to support him. You had good people that were there at the rallies. And then you had people who broke the law, yeah. right? There's a difference. Don't group everybody together. There's a difference. But when President Trump had the opportunity to stop it, when he had the opportunity to say it, the bully pulpit matters. People listen. He didn't. And I, and I hate that for the people that were there supporting him. I hate that for those of us that were watching it. But what I do know is he was the right president at the right time. But the situation we're on in now, nobody wants that chaos again. That's what we're trying to get past. My approach is different. No drama, no vendettas, no whining. At one of your town halls this week, uh, there was a voter that stood up and said, You really need to turn it up on Donald Trump that he attempted a coup on national TV. You need to call it what it is. You need to go after him hard. It's interesting because I just heard you say that he was the right president for the right time. What, what, what do you say to voters like that that say that you really need to draw that line? Because I answer... I mean, you have drawn it at times, and other times you say he was the right president for the right time. He's fit for office. I mean, you're one of those, too. Y'all want me to either love him or hate him all the no, time. I'm just asking you to respond to a New Hampshire voter. I mean, so I did, yeah. and I responded to him in every way. And what I said to them was, anti-Trumpers want me to hate him, pro-Trumpers want me to love him, but this is where I stand. There are things I agree with the president on. I had a good working relationship with him. There are things I don't agree. I don't agree with the fact that, yes, we had a good economy while he was there, but he put us eight trillion dollars in debt that our kids are never going to forgive us for. I don't agree with how he handles national security. He focused on trade with China, but he did nothing about the fentanyl flow. He did nothing about the fact that fentanyl has killed so many of our Americans. I don't think you should praise Hezbollah. I don't think you should criticize Netanyahu when Israel's down on her knees. I don't think you should congratulate the Chinese Communist Party on their 70th anniversary. I think that when it comes to national security, we don't praise thugs. We let them know where we stand, and we let them know they'll be held to pay if they do anything against us. That's who I am. I mean, he's running on retribution. He wants to go out, and he talks about annihilating his enemies and using the criminal justice system to do so. What, what do you... What do you think of that? You guys are exhausting. You're yeah. exhausting in your obsession with him. The thing is, the normal people aren't obsessed with Trump like you guys are. The normal people care about the fact that they can't afford things. They feel like their freedoms are being taken away. They think government's too big. 
I know y'all want to talk about every single word he says and every single tweet he does. That's exactly why we need a new generational leader. Because people don't want to hear about every word a person says or every tweet. They want to know how you fought for them that day. And they want to know how their life is going to be different. And life would be a whole lot different if the media would stop this obsession with Trump. I mean, I was just asking you about his central campaign theme, which is, I want, you know, I am your retribution. And he's winning in the polls. That's why I'm asking. Well, if, if I could, you know, one I'm thing, asking about yeah. the leading candidate. That you're he does everything against. he can not to talk about issues. Yeah. He almost acts like he wasn't there, right? Yeah. He doesn't want to talk about building the wall and securing the southern border because he didn't do it. He doesn't want to talk about fiscal responsibility because he made a hard promise that he would do it in that debate. I'm going to be the most fiscally responsible president this country's ever seen, he said. He balance started, the budget. Yeah. <laughs> didn't even try to balance the budget. And, you know, the thing that for someone in New Hampshire where, you know, it's not about big government, we loved the idea that he was going to drain the swamp. That was an amazing opportunity. Didn't even try. I mean, literally didn't even try. So if he talks about those issues, he has to kind of own those failures. So he's always going to talk about retribution and just kind of try to spur something up. And if you want to talk about Trump, if you really want to talk about Trump, why don't you go ask him if he's going to get on a debate stage in Iowa, where Iowa's voting? Why don't you go ask him if he's going to get on a debate stage in New Hampshire, yeah, no, where Granite good. Staters are voting? That's what you should be asking as the media, not asking about what he happened to say today. Uh, that's a good question, which we have asked. But let me move on. Uh, we had the Texas Supreme Court uh, abortion case, really a kind of a tragic case. Kate Cox, the Supreme Court, uh, ruled that she could not have an abortion, even though her doctor said... Uh, that her health was in danger, it might jeopardize her ability to have children in the future, uh, that the baby, that the fetus was almost certainly not going to survive. Um, did you, do you disagree with that decision by the Texas Supreme Court? Well, I think that it is the right thing that unelected justices no longer decide this, and it's in the hands of the people. I appreciate that Texas went more on the pro-life side, but as we go through this, listen, my heart broke for her because I had trouble having my children. These, the states are now going to have to look at these because what we don't want to see is a woman with a rare condition having to carry a baby until term. But let me just ask you just really directly, do you think the Supreme Court in Texas made the wrong decision? Chris Christie has come out and said it was the wrong decision, and he's criticized you for not giving a direct answer. Can you give a direct answer now? I mean, the Supreme the Court decision? said what, that the law that the state put was, was the one that they had to follow, right? The Supreme Court said that she could not have the abortion. That was the rule. Right. So that's when a state corrects itself and says, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? We tweak okay. things all the time as so governors. So it was the right decision by the court? Well, the court had to follow the law. The law said that she couldn't have the abortion. Now it's up to the legislature in Texas to say, how do we make sure there are no more cases that go through that? That's what you look at. As a governor, you don't just say this is golden. As a governor, when something happens that churns your stomach, that says that's not what this was intended to be, you go back and say, okay, what do we do to make sure that the, that we are saving as many babies as possible, but also supporting as many moms as possible? It's not as cut and dry as everybody wants, but states will self-correct to this. That's what they do. But if, I think to Nikki's point, it's in the law. Right, the court. So the problem is the, the court, law. The, the problem is not the court's decision. Is that the court's? The court's only only decision is 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 the law. To are, are they following the law? the law? So I think what Nikki's saying well, is lower exactly court right. Is one way the Supreme Court ruled. And what Nikki is saying is it, the, the if there's a, a problem there, it's in the law, and that's up to the citizens and the and the lawmakers and the, and the legislature. That's how states do it. Thank you very much. I've got one more question for you. Uh, I, I heard the governor say, "When you win New Hampshire, yeah. are you going to win New Hampshire?" My goal is to be strong in Iowa, strong in New Hampshire, strong in South Carolina. But you, you need to win somewhere, right? I mean, what... I mean, you're saying that. I, what I'm saying is, why don't we try and do the best we can in every state yeah. and let the people decide which way this goes? I think I'm going to be strong in Iowa. I think I'm going to be strong in, in New Hampshire. I think we're going to be strong in South Carolina, and I think we're going to take it. And we're not settling for anything else. And you can be more direct about New Hampshire. Oh, it's an absolute win. No, it's a, it's a win in a reset button. If everyone that could vote in the primary comes out and votes, not only she's going to win in a landslide, and, and that's not an exaggeration. So we're going to see you a set record. The bar for you here. No, it's, it's not an expectation. He knows his state better than I do. It's not an expectation. It's people getting excited. It's exciting. We can feel it on the ground. We're going to do this. Our thanks to Nikki Haley and Chris Sununu for that interview.